When we think about the greatest traitors of, in all of human history, there's a, a few names which probably pop right into your minds. I'll put some pictures on the screen this morning. Here in the United States, it's always Benedict Arnold, right? We think about this colonial hero who, towards the end of the Revolutionary War, changed sides and went over to the English. If you're a student of ancient history or Rome, it's Marcus Junius Brutus, Junius Brutus who uh, was a close friend of Julius Caesar, very close friend, who ended up not just being in on the plot to assassinate him, but one of the men who plunged a dagger into the body of his friend. And just as nations have their traitors and names of infamy that go down in human history, so does the kingdom of God. The archetype of all that being Judas Iscariot. Along with Hitler, Judas perhaps has the most dishonored name in the history of all mankind, and for good reason. Now, there have been other betrayers in the kingdom of God, of course, and one story that only the true historical nerds out there know about is the sad tale of this guy. His name is John Maitland. John Maitland was a Scottish theologian and politician who as a young man was invited to a very important gathering of Reformed ministers at Westminster Abbey in London. The year was 1643 and 120 theologians and members of parliament gathered to draw up a confession of faith and a catechism for what they hoped would become the Reformed Church of England in Scotland. And so they gathered in this room in Westminster Abbey. If you've ever been there, you know how grand that location is. 120 of them filled with famous Puritans, men like Richard Baxter and Thomas Goodwin and Jeremiah Burroughs, and John Maitland was among them, having been recognized in Scotland as one of the most skilled and zealous defenders of the Protestant Reformation. And yet, 17 years later, after the English Civil War, something in John Maitland snapped. Something made him drastically change. This is a guy who had not only written about Reformed theology, but had suffered for his convictions. He'd spent time in prison for his convictions. He had written letters of courage and faith and accepted this idea of suffering for the cause of Christ. But after the English Civil War, when Charles II was restored as the King of England and began to undo all that the English Reformation had put into place, John Maitland switched sides. And he became one of the king's most influential advisors. Former friends and colleagues wrote to him in anguish, warning him against his apostasy, pleading with him to come back to the Reformed faith, back to the cause of Christ, but to no avail. John Maitland grew so powerful as part of that regime that eventually he became a persecutor of the same Reformed faith that he had once proclaimed and suffered for. He even commissioned troops to hunt down Reformers, putting some of his former fellow Reformers in prison and sending some to the gallows. And for his treacherous work on behalf of the crown, he was dubbed a lord in the land and given the formal title Duke of Lauderdale. How does that happen? <laughs> does that type of story shock you? How is it that someone who appears to be a devoted and serious follower of Christ ended up becoming an enemy? This week in my study time, I went online to search for a secular answer to a very simple question. What is the psychology behind betrayal? And to my surprise, there actually wasn't a, a lot written about that subject. A lot written about how we should respond to betrayal, but very little written about the psychology behind betrayal itself. When I did find a source here or there, the answers that they gave, gave me was pretty much what I expected. And guess what? They basically agreed with what the New Testament said 2,000 years ago. Surprising, right? The primary motivations behind betrayal are primarily these three things according to secular sources. And you'll recognize all of them from Scripture. Ambition, lust, and greed. Ambition, lust, and greed. Three things that when deeply lodged in the human heart will outweigh and overtake any sense of loyalty that one feels to another, even to a close friend, even to a spouse will outweigh and overtake if they're lodged deeply in the heart. A betrayer will go to any lengths to satisfy his or her deepest desires, whatever it takes. 
which is exactly what James tells us, right? Let's go back to the Bible, James 4. What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you, James asks? Answer, don't they come from your passions that wage war within you? You lust and do not have, so you commit murder. You're envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and wage war. And that was certainly the case in the life of John Maitland. His friendships, his theological convictions appeared to be so solid for a while. But when he was presented with an opportunity for things like fame and power and the type of rewards that come with being a friend of the king, he was lured away. And in that moment, as he was lured away, the real truth, not the fake stuff, the real truth about what lay in his heart was exposed. And he decided he would do whatever was necessary to gratify, gratify his deepest desires, to embrace his greatest love, which wasn't Jesus. Now, if you'd known John Maitland, you said, Jesus is his greatest love. But his heart was laid open. Jesus was not his greatest love. John Maitland had the opportunity to go down in history as one of the great faithful men of God. But instead, even the Encyclopedia Britannica summarizes his life with this phrase, quote, he was widely hated for his ruthless and repressive rule in Scotland, end quote. That's his legacy. And it may be far worse than just lying his online, uh, worse than his online reputation, but we'll leave the status of his eternal soul up to God. Are you shocked by it? Shouldn't be. Even Paul was struck by betrayal in his ministry, right? He writes to Timothy at the very end of his life. At the very end of his life. He says, make every effort to come to me soon, Timothy. For Damos, having loved this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia, only Luke is with me. You can almost hear the pain and the disappointment in his words. I'm sure Paul loved Demas. I'm sure he cared deeply for this man because we know Paul's character, right? I'm sure, I'm sure he invested time in him, walked through life and ministry with him, only at the very end, in his final days, to feel the sting of his desertion. And now, picture this now. You've got the greatest evangelist who's ever walked the earth sitting in a rotten, stinking Roman jail cell facing execution and there's only one person with him to bring him comfort. You talk about having to have your hope in Christ alone. In that moment, that's what got Paul through. Now, here's the thing. No experience in the kingdom of God is wasted. You may not realize it, but men like Judas and John Maitland and Damos serve as warnings to us today. Lest we get lazy lest we stop thinking about important things. Who is saved? Who is saved? According to Hebrews 3, the one who does not become hardened by the deceitfulness of sin, but endures in faith to the end. That's the truth. So a faithful track record in the past is a wonderful thing, but we'd better have a faithful present. It's one thing to have a past to say, look, I got saved back at this time and I've been faithful in the past. What about now? What about now? We better have a rock solid hope for the future that's going to carry us to the finish line. Otherwise, we too are at risk. And if you're here this morning and you're like, this isn't me, this, I'm immune to this. Be careful. Consider Paul's warning to the Corinthians after telling the church about how the Israelites fell in the wilderness because of their lack of faith. Paul says this, these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction, the church on whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. It's a serious warning. And here's a serious question. And I'm going to give you a second to think about it. Don't say anything out loud. <laughs> what would it take to lure you away from your loyalty to Christ? What would it take to lure you away from your commitment, your loyalty, your love to Christ and His Word? Hopefully, your genuine answer is not a thing in this world. Nothing. 
If not, if Jesus isn't your greatest love, then this morning is a really good wake-up call. Satan knows the weak spot in your defenses. If you picture your life as a fortress, Satan knows where all the cracks in the wall are. He is a master fisherman, and he knows exactly which lures to use in your life. That's what happened to Judas. So don't take the warnings of Scripture lightly. Guard your heart with all diligence. I'll have more to say about that at the end. So question now, is this all just in the past? Is this just church history? Oh, Jeff, you and your church history. (laughs) All this history. What about today? Well, sadly, tragically, falling away and betrayal are on the rise in our time these days. That's one of the reasons why I think this message about Judas is so timely and so important because of the times that we live in. It's become almost fashionable to deconstruct one's faith these days. And deconstruction almost always leads to completely walking away over time. Let's just be honest. We can play games about, well, this sounds really exciting and fun. Let's deconstruct our faith. It almost always leads to a denial of gospel truth. It's also quite common after deconstruction for people to turn around and then do intentional harm to Christ and the church. And we're seeing it all over the place today. Let me give you a couple faces of spiritual betrayal today, lest you think it can't happen. Dan Barker on the upper left there. Dan Barker was an evangelist at the age of 15, a traveling evangelist in a very charismatic denomination. By 35, he had turned hardcore atheist. Now he spends his life, makes quite a good living, writing books and showing up on talk shows to talk about the falsehoods of Christianity. Charles Templeton, next to him, evangelist, shared the stage with Billy Graham, close friend with Billy Graham for many, many years, co-founder of Youth for Christ. He died in 2001 as an atheist, writing books about his apostasy. Josh Harris, former megachurch pastor at the age of 30. A wonder kid in the church, they said. Author of the book, I Kiss Dating Goodbye. In 2019, he announced he was walking away from his faith. He renounced all of his books, renounced all of his sermons, left his wife, and went into marketing. He is now a social media rock star who daily, daily engages with people, scorns Christians, and accepts adulation, people who cheer on his apostasy. Paul Maxwell, he's one of the smarter guys, PhD in theology, professor, former staff writer at Desiring God, walks away from his faith. His new love, he says, is fitness and writing books about church trauma. The three guys that come next are musicians. Dan Hazeltine, Kevin Max, Marty Sampson, you know the first two famous 90s CCM bands. Jars of Clay, DC Talk, Marty Sampson, one of the chief writers for Hillsong and artists at Hillsong. I mention them because the power of music to both lead and mislead is extreme. And these guys for a time led people towards Christ. Now they're leading people away from Christ. Music's powerful. Last one, Abraham Piper, John Piper's son. Twice disciplined out of the church, now a spiteful mocker of his father. And the church has a massive following on TikTok and YouTube, every social media piece. Real Hebrew 6 stuff. Nasty stuff. He's a hater of the church. He's a betrayer. So I give you those examples just so you can see some faces. Not a lot has changed since the days of Demos. All these people have at least one thing in common. They love this present world. They love this present world. They love themselves more than they ever loved Jesus. Their lives show it. Whenever you watch the lives of those who deconstruct and fall away, you see that it always leads to adopting views that are popular with the unbelieving world. Always. It's always a shift in worldview and ethics that moves with the flow of culture, not against it. And it ends with evolving positions on things like sexuality and gender and sin and hell and a general realigning of social values towards liberalism. And when a person gives in to the lure of the world and walks away from biblical convictions, guess what? They always always come out and they give interviews and say how good they feel now to have walked away, 
how good it feels, how liberating, how happy they feel. And they say, this is proof. This is my proof that I did the right thing by walking away from Christianity. And my response is always, of course it feels good. Of course it is. You think you've gotten out from under accountability to God. You think you are now Lord of your own life. Now you can pursue all of your lusts and desires and ambitions without anybody holding you back, without any guilt. You are your own little God. Finally, you can love yourself above everybody around you. You can love yourself more than anything. And guess what? There comes with that a temporary euphoria. But it's all a lie. It's a facade. You've been deceived by the enemy. What comes next then piles onto that lie. These betrayers go out and find a multitude of unbelievers who will do nothing but love and affirm them for moving towards lawlessness with them. All kinds of likes on social media. Just building up their egos, making them feel better about their decision. They are celebrated by the powers of darkness and they revel in it. I follow some of these guys on social media. I see it every day, how they mock Christianity and then revel in the love of lawless people. And then for many, it feels really good to strike back at what they perceive was the very thing that held back their joy all these years. They will slander God and his church all day and night. So just know that this is happening. And, and as you see it, and as you think about Damos, and you think about Judas, just know that the Bible's not shocked by any of it. We know what this is. This is the arrogance of man on display. This is Romans 1 stuff. The irrationality of sin, the foolishness of sin. It's the darkness of the human heart, and it's demonically aided. And the Bible predicts it, so we don't have to be surprised. 1 Timothy 4.1, the Spirit explicitly says, explicitly, that in later times, we are in later times right now, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. Hebrews 6, which Grant already read this morning, listen to the language again. Those who have once been enlightened have tasted the heavenly gift, have shared in the Holy Spirit, have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come and then fallen away. That's shocking. 1 John chapter 2. John says, Even now many antichrists have come. They went out from us, but they did not belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. However, they went out so that it might be made clear that none of them belongs to us. What do we believe these days? Our feelings? Or do we believe the text of Scripture? It's a big question for all of us. All right, that's a lot of background. Grab your Bibles. <laughs> Let's go to John 13. All right, here's what we're going to do today. We're going to read a lot of verses, verses 18 to 30, the entire story of the betrayal of Judas in the upper room, but here's what I want to tell you. Last night about 8 o'clock, I came into Tanny and I said, it's two sermons. <laughs> it's, it's got to be two sermons, right? Because you got, some of you guys know this because you've asked me the question, like, how much do you write? And in order to, in order to keep my sermons within a period of time that you will stay focused... I try to, try to write 11 pages. Sometimes I'll drift into 12. At 8 o'clock, I'd written 19 pages. And I was like, there's more. So anyway, here's what we're going to do today. We're going to walk through the narrative itself and make some observations. But I feel like I need to have you raise your right hand and promise you'll be back next week because next Sunday, we're going to go into a slew of deeper things that are behind this story. So stick with me on this. All right. Listen, this is a, a familiar story to most of us. Right? We've read it before, we've seen, maybe seen it dramatized, and we're always tempted to read the Gospels and stories like this the same way we watch our favorite movies over and over again, because we like to know the whole story. We like, it's fun to engage in the movie knowing how it's going to end, right? And we know how the Gospels end. We know that soon Jesus is going to be arrested, and he's going to be tortured, he's going to be crucified, right? All within a few hours of, of this narrative in the upper room. We also know that 
Three days later, he's going to be raised from the dead. He's going to be alive again. He's going to show himself to his disciples and hundreds of others. But as we read this story, I want you to try to think of it for the first time. Because none of the things that we know were at all clear to these 12 men sitting in that room that night. So you got to, again, put, your, put yourself into their sandals. They don't know the end like we do. For them, this evening started as just a special private Passover gathering where they were expected to feast and worship Yahweh and enjoy time with the Master. That, that was their expectation. For them, that's what they were looking forward to. Now, three weeks ago, we left off at verse 11. So let's look at verse 12 now. Remember, Jesus has just done the unthinkable, hasn't he? In that upper room, he is stripped down to, a, to, the, to the, uh, the clothing of a slave. He's taken on the, the, the posture of a servant, and he has washed the disciples' feet. Amazing stuff, right? Now let's pick up the narrative at verse 12. Jesus now returns to the table after washing feet. Verse 12, so when he had washed their feet and taken his garments and reclined at the table again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you or for you, depending on your translation? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you also should do as I did to you. In other words, here's a pattern that you should be imitating. Verse 16, Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. And I pointed out last week, knowing it is fantastic, but just knowing it is useless. You've got to do it, right? Jesus says you're blessed if you do these things, if you serve one another. Now, remember, as these 12 guys walked into the room that night, they were arguing about who was the greatest among them. And Jesus, knowing that his hour was near, set out to show them in this very visible, tangible way what it means to be truly great in God's kingdom. In the world, greatness is measured by who serves you and how many people serve you. But God's ways are not man's ways. In the kingdom now, listen, greatness serves. It's not the way of the world. In the kingdom, greatness serves. Greatness picks up the wash basin and the towel and puts the priority on others, not on the self. Listen, this is the great difference between the believer and the betrayer. One who believes and one who betrays. The emphasis is on others, not on self. Now, before we get into the drama itself, stop and consider what's happening behind the scenes. How much does Judas know in this moment what's going on? He can't possibly know that he's, he's already been predestined as the son of destruction. But he can't know that in his human limited view. But he has been prior to this gathering and was, even as he came into that upper room, he had been plotting to hand over Jesus to the Jewish authorities. In fact, he was prepared to carry out this plot as Jesus was washing his feet. Think about that. Imagine, what was he thinking and feeling as Jesus pulled up with the basin in front and began to wash his feet? What was he, th- what was he, fe- what was he going through? What type of guilt and, and weight was he feeling in that moment? Now, verse 18, the drama starts. Verse 18, I do not speak of all of you, Jesus says. I know the ones I have chosen, but the scripture must be fulfilled. He who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me. So Jesus transitions here from teaching a universal principle about serving one another, and now he declares a truth that I'm guessing shocked everybody in the room, made them all go quiet. What I've just taught you does not apply to everybody in this room. Remember, this is a, this is a private gathering space. Okay, it's, it's not like we're in a room of, of several hundred people, and yeah, there's some guy, we don't know who he is. He's a betrayer. It's a small room with 12 guys. What what I've just said does not apply to everybody. Only to those whom I have chosen. Now, the room must have gone quiet as as the processing of the mind is happening among these 12. You know, what does Jesus mean? Is he saying that somebody in this room, in this group who we've ministered together is not chosen? But, But hold on a second, they must have thought. We've been together for three years. 
We've all been committed to the gospel. Jesus called all of us to this ministry. So what on earth is going on? Well, in hindsight, because we know the story, we know the answer. One of the 12 was not a true believer. Did he follow Jesus? Yes. Did he profess belief with his lips? Yes. Did he do the work of ministry? Yes. Had he been a friend and companion of Jesus? Yes. But there were competing desires in Judas. And so he had never surrendered his heart to the master. We'll get to that later. And Jesus had hinted to this way up in, look at verse 10. He said, you are clean, speaking to those in the room, but not all of you. He had dropped that hint in verse 10. One of you here tonight remains in his sin. He's not clean. And then Jesus quotes here from Psalm 41. And if you look up Psalm 41, it speaks of a treacherous, unexpected attack from a close friend. Somebody here at the table who is sharing bread with us right now is about to lift up his heel against me. Imagine the tension in that room. Now, here's why Jesus felt the need to say this out loud. Look at verse 19. From now on, I am telling you before it comes to pass, so when it does occur, you may believe that I am he the divine name that I am. And this is such a gracious moment. Jesus knows, listen, Jesus knows how hard it's going to hit his guys when they find out that Judas has betrayed him. He knows that. It's going to rock their world and everything they thought they knew. And as the disciples put themselves through the same mental process that you and I would put ourselves through, thinking, why didn't I see the signs? Why didn't I catch this? Jesus wants to graciously prepare them and to protect them and to help them through it. So when it happens, he says, remember, I told you it was going to happen. Remember that it was predicted in the scriptures. Understand, I knew this was coming and I voluntarily yielded to it. Do not let it rock your faith. And that's, good. that's a good lesson for all of us. When we see people fall away, even celebrities, don't let it rock your faith. And as you do that, as you, as you recognize, guys, that I told you this was coming, that it had been predicted in the, in the scriptures, realize that I am he, I am Messiah and the Son of God. And that's the point of what's coming next in verse 20. Because as hard as this is going to be on the 11, they're going to have to get past it and press forward with the mission. Verse 20, truly, truly, I say to you, he who receives, he who receives whomever I send receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. In other words, guys, when this is all said and done, you are going to be sent out as ambassadors, and you will represent me, and you will represent my Father. So you cannot get bogged down in the past. You cannot get bogged down by unbelief and apostasy and traitors. I know those who belong to me. I'm in control of this. This would be a comfort later on. In that moment, the question is, how much do they understand at this moment? Probably not a lot, but this is going to be a great comfort to them later when everything is laid bare. I'm sure they were trying to process it in the moment, but John does tell us one thing for sure. They could see that Jesus was becoming visibly troubled. Here comes the bombshell in verse 21. When Jesus had said this, he became troubled in spirit. John sees it. And he testified and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And there it is. No more hinting. No more vague references to, hey, this is coming someday. He drops it in plain, straight language. There is a traitor in the room with us tonight. Think about the closest friends you've had here at Oak Hill or in any church. Imagine being in a room with them and finding out one of them is a spiritual traitor. Wow. Wow. Now, culturally, it was a very significant thing to sit at a man's table and to break bread with him. In fact, sharing a meal like this back in that day in that culture was like establishing a covenant of friendship. But now there's a traitor. And on Passover, at the Feast of Passover, to find this out, this is a big deal. All that we've been through for three years, and now there's a traitor in our midst? How can that be? So what happens next? Well, the physical setup of the table begins to matter from this point forward. So I, I put this 
this picture up before. I'll show it to you again. It's a pretty decent artist's rendering of what it might have looked like, although I would, for reasons which I'll explain in a bit, I think the room was probably bigger than the artist was able to portray here, that the table was maybe wider and the guys were maybe more spread out than this. We'll see why. But a couple of important things. The data that we have from the gospel, all four gospels, and from the accounts of the early church fathers tell us that John was likely sitting to Jesus' right. In fact, here we go. I'll start putting some names up here. There it is. See, the artist has pictured John looking young, right? Looking younger than the rest of them, which I think is great, and leaning into Jesus. And it's likely that Judas had been on Jesus' left. Ironically, in a seat of great honor. In a seat of great honor, but also providential and purposeful for what about, what's about to happen. Look at verse 22. The disciples began looking at one another at a loss to know which of them was speaking. He was speaking of, right? There was, rec- there was reclining on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Now, that's a strange statement in verse 23, right? We don't often use the word bosom, right? Talking about Jesus' chest, right? John is leaning into him. Now, look, I know this makes some modern-day men uncomfortable, but we got to get over it. Okay, if you've ever been to the Middle East, you know that that, that type of touching and affection between men is, is very commonplace. It's just a cultural thing. He's leaning on Jesus. That's how much John loves him. And John loves him so much and wants to lift up Jesus so much, he won't even put his own name in the text. He's just glad to go down in history as the disciple Jesus loved. Isn't that beautiful? Point is, John's in close proximity to the master as he announces this betrayal. And the next verse tells us that Peter must have been somewhere across the table looking at John. In fact, I'll, I'm just going to guess. Maybe that's Peter in the artist's rendering. Across the table, looking at John. Look at verse 24. So Simon Peter gestured to him, that's John, and said to him, tell us who it is whom he's speaking. So typical Peter, he wants to know, who's the bad guy? Right? Right? But because of the distance between himself and Jesus at this table, he couldn't discreetly ask the master without everybody hearing. So he sort of gestures to John. And the way, here's the way I picture this going down. I know I'm, I'm, I'm not adding to the text. I'm trying to bring it alive a little bit. So, so Peter's, Peter's sitting there, and he, he catches eyes with John. He's like, bro, <laughs> ask him, ask him. <laughs> uh, sort of. Sort of the way I see it, right? Like, psst. ask him. And, and, and so, verse 25, he, leaning back thus on Jesus' bosom, that's John, said to him, Lord, who is it? Right? It's, it's all quiet and private. He leans in close at this point. He whispers, Lord, who are you talking about? Who's the bad guy? Now, Think about the grace of the Lord here. This would have been Jesus' opportunity to go, it's Judas, and everybody dogpiled the guy, right? (laughs) But he doesn't reveal the identity of the betrayer. He doesn't expose him in front of the others. Listen, I have little doubt that if Peter found out it was Judas, he'd have gone across the table and stopped him. But that's not the Father's plan. And this is so key. That's not the Father's plan. That's not what the Father wants. So Jesus tells only John, he tells him quietly and privately, verse 26, Jesus answered, that is the one for whom I shall dip the morsel and give it to him. In other words, John, watch. What I'm about to do next matters. Now think about this moment. If John is over here and Judas is over here, Judas is sweating right now. Does he hear what's going on? He's got to be sweating. Jesus announced the betrayal out loud. What's going through his mind? Whoa, how does he know? How does he know I met with the religious authorities? He's got to be nervous. He's caught. The only question now is, is he going to be exposed? Rest of verse 26. So when Jesus had dipped the morsel, he took and gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Now, more cultural context needed here. In that day, the host of a feast like this at Passover, would often make a point to pause and to take a particularly delicious-looking piece of bread and dip it into a common bowl and offer it to somebody at the table as a special recognition, as a special honor. It's like, it's like we do toasts at weddings. 
We stop and we do a toast so everybody pays attention. This was seen as a mark of courtesy and esteem and friendship. And if Judas was reclining to Jesus' left, you can see how easily this would have been executed. Jesus dips, he turns directly towards Judas. And don't you wonder, did they lock eyes for a moment? Did Judas look away? I mean, how much tension was there in this moment? It's an offer, isn't it? It's an offer of honor and friendship. From the master to his betrayer. Now it seems from this account and from Matthew's as well. Then again, all this transpired transpired privately in very hushed tones. Three people know what's going on at this point. Jesus, John, and Judas. And my guess is Peter's still at the other side of the table going, what? What? (laughs) Right? He's just like, somebody fill me in here. But it's all kept sort of private. Now, now this is the moment of truth. What's Judas going to do? The morsel has been handed to him. He's got two options, doesn't he? He can decline that morsel as unworthy of that honor. He can fall on his face, confess his wickedness, and beg for forgiveness. Or he can take the morsel and eat it, keep his mouth shut, and stick with the plan. It's the moment of decision. It's the moment of decision. What does he do? He takes the morsel from Jesus' hand. He eats it. And again, I I just have to know, did he feel any sense of guilt at that moment? Any sense of conviction? Verse 27, after the morsel, Satan then entered into him. We'll have a lot to say about Satan next week, by the way. Truth is, it was already in the heart of Judas to betray Jesus. There was no going back. There was no recovery at this point. He'd hardened his heart beyond recovery, and so he took this morsel and it sealed his doom. As he shut his heart against Christ, he opened it up to the devil, and he literally, quite literally, according to the text, surrendered himself to the powers of darkness. And this blows my mind, but Satan was present in, not just a demon, Satan himself is present in that room, watching this proceeding, ready to pounce on this man that he has been grooming for some time. For this particular role. Continuing in verse 27. Again, this happens quietly and privately in a whisper. Therefore, Jesus said to Judas, what you do, do quickly. In effect, Jesus dismissed him from the table. He dismissed him. I I think it's possible that Judas hadn't planned on executing his plot that night. But Jesus says, go. Do it. Get it done. Judas is being purposely excluded from the table because Jesus is about to give his true disciples final instructions before his death. And Judas has no part in those things. And Judas, now a man whose mind is darkened, his heart captured, he leaves as quickly as he can to find his co-conspirators. And so I, I guess the artist is picturing the shadow in the doorway as Judas leaves and you see the empty spot to Jesus' left at the table. Sad. Sad. Only 11 at the table now. Within hours of of this verse, Judas will be dead by his own hand. We'll talk about suicide next week as well. Now, here's how we know that this all took place quietly and privately in hushed tones. Look at verse 28. The disciples can't hear what's going on. This is also, by the way, why I think the the table was probably wider and there was more space between the guys because they couldn't hear. Verse 28. Now, no one of those reclining at the table knew for what purpose he had said this to him. Some were supposing, because Judas Judas had the money box, that Jesus was saying to him, buy the things we have need for for the feast or else that he should give something to the poor. Guys, think about this. Still, Nobody had a clue that Judas was a traitor. His closest friends did not know what was happening in his heart. Amazing. Amazing. They all thought Judas had some business to do on behalf of the group. By the way, there's historical accuracy to this. We know from from, uh, Jewish writings that on the eve of Passover, it was often uh, a time for people to bring the gifts and alms to the temple and they would leave the doors of the temple open all that night so the poor and beggars could come and receive. So it made sense to the group, oh, he's going off to the temple to 
to drop off some alms. Makes sense. Okay, final statement from John, loaded with theology. Verse 30. So after receiving the morsel, he went out immediately, and it was night. Jesus' final act of love, the offering of that morsel, becomes with terrible immediacy the decisive moment of judgment. And with the sweet taste of that piece of bread in his mouth, Judas leaves behind everything that he claimed he once loved. He turns his back on his closest friends. He turns his back on the master. And it says he went out into the night. That is not just the time of day. He went out into spiritual darkness. Tragic. Tragic stuff. Now, again, there's a lot coming next week. I got to wrap up soon this morning. Let me leave you with a few facts about Judas that we can learn from, something that we can take home this week. And, and, and maybe you've already picked up on some of this, but it's really important. First of all, there's no reason to doubt Judas' sincerity as a follower of Jesus at the beginning. There's nothing in the text that tells us that he wasn't sincere when he first began to follow Jesus. Uh, like all the other disciples, I'm, I'm, I'm sure he left everything he loved behind and went on the road with the Lord. And spending the entirety of Jesus' public ministry with him, he had been a faithful student. He'd been a close companion, a friend of Jesus, a friend. They would have shared many, many meals together. They would have had deep conversations as they walked all over the land of Israel. They probably sat around evening fires talking about the kingdom of God. Imagine this. They would have spent time together in prayer. Wow. From the outside, Judas's faith appeared to be genuine. I'm sure he said and he did all the right things that made him fit in with the other 11. And obviously, none of the other 11 picked up on any hint at all that there was anything wrong. And now let me stretch your mind even further. Look at this verse. Luke tells us that at one point, Jesus called together the 12, that includes Judas, and gave them power and authority over all demons and to heal diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom. So Judas was actively involved in gospel ministry as an unbeliever. He was preaching the news of Christ to others as an unbeliever. He was involved in healing and casting out demons, doing miracles in Jesus' name as an unbeliever. He never truly believed. Now, you say, well, wait, how do you know he never believed? Well, follow John's logic throughout his gospel. No one can come to Jesus unless the Father draws him. Amen? All that the Father gives to Jesus will come to him. Amen? Once they come, no one can snatch them from Jesus' hand. Amen? If they had belonged to Christ, they would have remained with Christ. But they went out so that it would be made clear that they never belonged to Christ in the first place. So we can confirm Judas never believed, never put his trust in Christ, never surrendered his heart wholly to Jesus, was never born again. And and here's the thing that ought to shake us up just a little bit. Because it it goes against this idea of a man-centered view of salvation. Listen, nobody had more direct evidence of who Jesus was than Judas. He walked with him for three years. Think about this. He saw the greatest life ever lived, up close and personal, right next to him. A life of perfect integrity and perfect obedience. He saw a perfect balance of grace and truth. He saw a perfect reliance upon God the Father. You could not design a better model of faith to be lived out in front of you, and yet Judas didn't believe. Shocking. Judas also heard all of the teaching. From from Jesus, the greatest wisdom ever spoken from a man's lips. He heard it. He heard all the sermons. Think about this. He likely received personal discipleship, instruction from the very Son of God, and yet he didn't believe. Think about all the miracles that he not only saw but participated in. Not only would he have seen Jesus feed those 5,000, he himself would have been part of the crew that picked up the fishes and the loaves and distributed the food. He participated in the miracle. He saw it. He would have been in the boat when Jesus stood up and calmed 
The power over nature calmed the seas on the Sea of Galilee. He was there. He would have known Lazarus. He would have seen Lazarus dead for four days in a tomb, see him come out alive. What more evidence does a man need? Judas had every advantage, far more than any of us here, yet he did not believe. He didn't believe. Think about this too. On the one hand, Judas heard all of the warnings. He heard Jesus condemn the Pharisees. So he knew that there was a hell that was awaiting those who rejected Jesus. Right? He he heard it. He heard the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus said, look, there's a road to life and it's very narrow and there's a road to destruction and it's very wide. He got the warnings. You can't say, well, he didn't, eh, nobody told him about hell. Wow. On the other hand, Judas also heard about the grace that was available to him. He heard Jesus tell the parable of the prodigal son, right? So he knew all about the merciful nature of God, that he could always be welcomed home and be forgiven. And still he rejected the truth and walked away. Next Sunday, we want to look at some of the potential human reasons why he did that. For today, I want you to consider this again. Greatest example... Greatest teaching, astounding miracles. He saw it all, and it didn't save Judas. So what do we learn from that? Well, how often do parents and family members and friends and church leaders beat themselves up when we see somebody fall away from the truth? Right? How could this happen, we say? Did I do something wrong? Did I, did I cause them to stumble out of the kingdom? Could I have done more? Did I fail in my teaching? Did I fail in my modeling? Well, maybe you, you didn't do as good a job as you could have. I mean, let's be honest, we all fall short, and I guarantee you didn't do it perfectly. But, but, the story of Judah shows us that it's not we who have the power to save anyone. It's not we who have the power to keep somebody in the truth. We don't have that power. We don't have the power to save. We don't have the power to keep someone who's begun a walk of faith from one day rejecting the truth. Now, it doesn't absolve us from our responsibility to strive in those areas and do the best we can. But in the end, God has to do this work. God does the work of regeneration. He does the work of justification. He does the work of perseverance. It's his work from beginning to end. If any of us are saved, it's because of him. If any of us endures to the end in faith, it's because of him. It's by grace and grace alone. We just sang the song. That's why we pray that God would save. If we could save people, we we wouldn't bother praying. We'd just work on our apologetics. This is where our theology of salvation really matters, guys. We know that God is the only one with the power to transform a human heart. So we pray. So we come to the throne of grace. And we ask that God would move, that he would draw, that he would save according to his will. And we do that even as we do our part. Yes, we work on our apologetics. Yes, we fine-tune our teaching. Yes, we strive to be an example for others so that they can see what a genuine saving faith looks like. But God does that work. So when we see somebody fall away, we don't, beat ourselves up. It's God's work. That's lesson number one. Here's the second. Active involvement in church life, being involved in regular ministry, as good and healthy as that is, that in and of itself is not proof that spiritual life is present. This is important for us to recognize. People can work and work and work for the kingdom. They can be at every single church event we do. They can sit in church year after year and hear biblical preaching. They can be doing ministry right alongside you and still not be surrendered in their hearts to the Lord. Judas is proof of this. That's why, guys, we have to be involved in one another's lives in this local church. That's why we need to develop deep relationships in the body. Find trusted brothers and sisters and seek to grow together. We need family in our lives who will ask us the hard questions, who will challenge us to open up our lives to one another. Now, as I say that, I'm not advocating that we foster an environment of suspicion. 
of one another, because there's dangers with that too, but we can't be naive that this can happen. We can't act like this can never happen. Look at Demas, look at Judas. So we've got to be aware of it. We have to be able to lovingly talk about the competing idols in our hearts. Where we're being tempted, where we're struggling, what those lures are that the enemy might use to try to draw us away from our first love and to pray for each other. We all need this. My experience in the evangelical church is everybody looks at each other and says, if you're good, I'm good, and that's it. We'll just go on with our lives, right? We'll see each other in passing, and I'll be in the back, you're in the front, but we'll sort of worship together, and you go your way, I'll go. No. That's how, that's how real people slip through the cracks. That's how real people fall away. It's dangerous. This is why promise number two in our church covenant is that, yes, we are our brother's keeper and our sister's keeper. We need to walk together in love, exercising an affectionate care and watchfulness over one another and faithfully admonishing one another when the occasion arises. That is number two in our covenant. That is our commitment to each other. And if we fail at this, And if we fail to heed the warnings of Scripture and we fail to look carefully at the example of the Israelites who fell in the wilderness, if we fail to look at what drove Demas and what drove Judas to to betray their first love, it's possible that someone here in our family, here at Oak Hill, might one day get up from the table and walk out into the night. May it never be at this church. Listen to these words that we sing all the time, and I'll close with this. Prone to wander, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. What's the answer? Well, the next line says, here's my heart, Lord. Take and what? Seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Let's bow our heads and ask the Lord to do that in our lives. I'm gonna give you a few moments of quiet time to just... Process, process with the Lord about what's happening in your heart right now. This is a great time to do that. Don't let it just be on Sunday mornings, but this is a great time as the Spirit has moved this morning to say, Lord, this is what's competing right now in my heart. Lord, never let me fall away from you. Take a few moments and pray.